Hello, I am Baal Kadmon, and I would like to thank you for watching and or listening to this podcast. Today I'm going to read you two chapters from my upcoming book, Baal, the Lord of the Heavens, Calling Down the Great God of Canaan, Canaanite Magic, Book 2. It says that it's going to be released in March, but actually it's going to be released in a few days, and it will be available in Kindle and paperback. You can pre-order it today, and once it's available, it'll go right into your Kindle. The audiobook will be available in approximately 10 days, but sometimes it's sooner. It all depends on their, the Audible QA. Sometimes they're a little finicky. It could take two days. It could take 10 days. So why is this book important? Uh, aside from what I usually add in these books, you know, history, a lot of history, there's going to be quite a bit here. And actually, one of the chapters I'm going to read tonight is uh, mostly history. There is a chapter there. Uh, in this book that will deal with how demonologists view Baal. And many demonologists, not all, so I'm not going to, you know, make an umbrella statement here, do not realize that many of the demons that they are calling are actually just different aspects of the god Baal. And on the surface, that seems pretty, you know, innocuous and innocent. But it actually betrays a Christian ideology regarding Baal. And I know that is very controversial to hear, but I deal with it in the book. And if you really want to know, just you'll see it right there. It's very, very prominently displayed. And I know I'm going to get a complete blowback from this, but I'm going to make my case in this book. So today I'm going to read the introduction. And uh, I think you'll get a nice little idea of what Baal is from the introduction. But then I will get into Baal in the Old Testament. And I think that is where you're going to learn things that you may not have known before. And the reason why I say this is because there are elements there that are quite subtle. And if you don't pay attention, you won't see the connection. So I'm going to be bringing concepts from the book of Numbers all the way to the book of Chronicles, and I'm going to put them together in a way that will make sense. Because most often we read a text and then we sort of forget it because these are small details. And so when we get to a text maybe four or five books away, we forget what we read you know, in the book of Numbers or, or there, and then we don't make that connection. So this chapter on Baal in the Old Testament is going to be very interesting because I'm going to bring together ideas that, again, if you're not paying attention, you won't get it. And this is in terms of Baal's names. Uh, I think it's a very fascinating thing. When I wrote this, I was like, oh, you know, people are really going to like this uh, because it's not apparent if you're not literally paying attention to every verse that you're reading. So I hope you enjoy it. I'm going to start this right now. We're going to read the introduction and Baal in the Old Testament. Enjoy. Introduction. The great Canaanite god Baal is one of the most malign deities in Western religious history. Only Satan is considered more sinister and evil. This is sad because Baal is not evil at all, but has been done an injustice, and that is something I will be discussing in great length later in this book. Despite his falsely ascribed reputation in Western religion, Baal is a mysterious god, with qualities very similar to that of Yahweh of the Old Testament. In fact, they might be more alike than you can imagine. In general, the Canaanite pantheon is one of the most mysterious pantheons of the ancient Middle East. Because of the Western taint, no one has truly discussed Baal in a way that does not reflect this bias. Sure, there have been discussions academically, but seldom spiritually, without this weird negativity. Even other books that discuss Baal in a magical practice do so with the inherent Western bias that he is this shady, dark character with sinister motives. Yes, he, like any other god and goddess, has this side, but he was also prayed to and worshipped for good and benevolent reasons as well. 
He was, in fact, a savior-like figure. In this book, we will not only learn how to call upon this great god magically, we will also dispel the myths surrounding him. As I do with all my books, I like to discuss history. I am a historian, after all. We will cover the history of Baal, his various aspects and forms, his worship and pervasiveness in ancient biblical writings, a brief overview of the Baal cycle, why Baal is incorrectly equated with the devil and evil in the West, demonological references to Baal from the most obvious to the least, and why they get it wrong. And finally, we will learn his great magic. He is very powerful, I must warn you. We have a lot to cover, so let us proceed. Baal in the Old Testament As I indicated earlier, Baal's influence has been widespread throughout the Middle East and parts of North Africa. He is very well known within the Old Testament as being the chief nemesis of Yahweh, he was mentioned about 90 times in the Old Testament. The Baal cult was so pervasive that it served as a constant thorn in the side of the Israelites. They were constantly ensnared by the Canaanite religion in general. This was seen especially when certain Israelite kings would endorse such worship. Another reason why Baal worship held such sway was because, for the most part, early Israelites were simply breakaway Canaanites. Yes, I know this is a controversial statement, but archaeology has painted that picture for quite some time. Let us take a look at the verses in the Old Testament in which Baal was worshipped by the Israelites, shall we? The first instance of Baal worship in the Old Testament can be found in the book of Numbers, chapter 25, verses 1 through 5. Here is the Hebrew first with an indication as to where the Baal name is present, and then I will provide the English translation. Please note that in these verses, Baal is referred to by one of his aspects, Baal Peor. Peor is a mountain near where the Israelites were in this verse. I will go into each aspect a bit later in the book. Vayishev Israel beshitim veyachel ha'am leznot el bnot Moav, vetikreen la'am letzivche Elohehen, veyachel ha'am veyishtachavu leelohehen, veyitzamed Israel leva'al pior, veyachar af Adonai beIsrael, vayomer Adonai el Moshe, kach et kol roshe ha'am, והורקה אותם לאדוני נגד השמש, וישב חרון אף אדוני מישראל. ויאמר משה אל שבטי ישראל, הרגו איש אנשיו הנצמדים לבעל פי אור. And Israel abode in Shittim, and the people began to commit harlotry with the daughters of Moab. And they called the people unto the sacrifices of their gods. The people did eat and bow down to their gods. And Israel joined himself unto the Baal Peor. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. And the Lord said unto Moses, Take all the chiefs of the people and hang them up unto the Lord in face of the sun, that the fierce anger of the Lord may turn away from Israel. And Moses said unto the judges of Israel, Slay ye every one, his men, and they that have joined themselves into Baal Peor. As you can see, the Lord was not happy about the Israelite backslide into Baal worship. Let us take a look at a few more verses here. The ones to follow are of a similar theme and can be found in the book of Judges. As in the above example, I will first provide the Hebrew and then the English. Judges chapter 2 verse 11 Viyasu bne Israel et hara bene Adonai viyavdu et habaalim And the children of Israel did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord and served the Baalim In this example the term for Baal is Baalim which is a plural word, so in essence they served the Baals. Uh, 
They use this term in the plural because, as I mentioned earlier, Baal had many forms and his worship was widespread. So instead of itemizing the individual locations in which Baal was worshipped, they simply lumped them all together as the Baals, whereas the last verse we find they worshipped the Baal that was in the Mount of Peor. Let's look at other ones. Judges chapter 3 verse 7. Vyasu bnei Israel et hara beene Adonai, vishkahu et Adonai Elohehem, vyavdu et habaalim ve et haasherot. And the children of Israel did that which was evil unto the sight of the Lord, and forgot the Lord their God, and served the baalim and the asherot. Here we have the same plural usage for Baal. We also see the plural of the goddess Asherah, Asherot. Now I'm going to uh, quote a few verses here, where it's going to be Judges chapter 6, verse 25, verse 28, and verse 30 through 32. Vayahi balayla hu, vayomer lo Adonai, kach et pa hashor asher laavicha, ufar sheni sheva shanim. והרסת את מזבח הבעל אשר לאביך, ואת האשרה אשר אליו תחרות. Now verse 28. וישכמו אנשי העיר בבוקר, והנה נותץ מזבח הבעל, והאשרה אשר אליו קורעת, ואת הפר השני אוהלה על מזבח הבנוי. Now verses 30-32. ויאמרו אנשי העיר אל יואש, הוצא את בניך וימות, כי נתץ את המצבח הבעל, וכי קראת האשר אשר אליו. ויאמר יואש לכל אשר עמדו, אליו האתם תרבון, לבעל אם אתם תושעון אותו אשר יריב לא ימות עד הבוקר, אם אלוהים הוא ירב לו כי נתץ את מזבחו. ויקרא לו ביום ההוא עיר הבעל. לעומר יריב בו הבעל כי נתץ את מזבחו. And it came to pass the same night that the Lord said unto him, Take thy father's bullock and the second bullock of seven years old and throw down the altar of Baal that thy father hath and cut down the Asherah that is by it. And when the men of the city arose early in the morning, behold, the altar of Baal was broken down and the Asherah was cut down that was by it, and the second bullock was offered upon the altar that was built. Then the men of the city said unto Joash, Bring out thy son, that he may die, because he hath broken down the altar of Baal, and because he hath cut down the Asherah that was by it. And Joash said unto all that stood against him, Will ye contend for Baal, or will ye save him? He that will contend for him shall be put to death before morning. If he be a god, let him contend for himself, because one hath broken down his altar. Therefore, on the day he was called Jerubal, saying, Let Baal contend against him, because he hath broken down his altar. In these examples, we have his name spelled out as Baal. However, in the Hebrew, the name is mentioned in some places as if they were speaking about an object. For example, Habaal, which means the Baal. This convention is used because they are referring to Baal as a kind of cult object, similar in language uh, used with the goddess Asherah as well. We often see Asherah mentioned as the Asherah. We also find here that they named a place after Baal, Jerubal. Okay, let's now look at Judges chapter 8, verse 33. Vayahi ka'asher met Gidon, v'yeshuvu b'nei Yisrael, v'yizenu achrei ha'ba'alim, v'yasimu lahem ba'al brit le'elohim. And it came to pass, as soon as Gideon was dead, that the children of Israel again went astray after the Baalim, and made Baal Brit their god. Here you can see that they are referring at first to the plural Baalim, and then get more specific here, and name him Baal Brit. 
I will get into the aspects of Baal a bit later in the book, but for now just know that the term Baal Brit means Lord of the Covenant, or Covenant Baal, as some academics call it. Let's now look at Judges 10, 6. Vayasifu b'nei Israel la'asot hara be'enei Adonai, v'yavdu et ha'ba'alim, v'et ha'ashterot, v'et Elohei Aram, v'et Elohei Tzidon, v'et Elohei Moav, v'et Elohei b'nei Amon, v'et Elohei Filishtim, v'azvu et Adonai, v'lo avduhu. And the children of Israel again did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord, and served the Baalim, and the Ashterot, and the gods of Aram, and the gods of Tzidon, and the gods of Moab, and the gods of the children of Ammon, and the gods of the Philistines, and they forsook the Lord, and served him not. Here we see Baal in plural again, as Baalim. Now let's look at 1 Samuel ver, uh, chapter 7, verse 4. ויאסרו בני ישראל את הבעלים ואת האשתרות, ויעבדו את אדוני לבדו. Then the children of Israel did put away the Baalim and the Ashterot, and served the Lord only. Here we see Baal in plural again as Baalim. The verses I supplied above are instances in which Baal was worshipped before the time of the monarchy. Now let us examine some of the verses indicating Baal worship during the time of the Israelite monarchy and beyond. This is where it gets interesting, and some of the instances that use Baal and a verse are thought to be referring simply to Yahweh or as Lord, since Baal also means Lord. I'm not so sure I believe that, and you will see why in a moment. The name Baal is often a suffix to a few names in the Bible. I will itemize them here because they are very important. You will see why in a moment, and you won't find this in any other occult book. For example, King David's minister was, that was in charge of olive trees in the Western Valley was named Baal Hanan, uh, which means the Lord is gracious, or Baal is gracious. And we see this in 1 Chronicles chapter 27, verse 28. And over the olive trees and the sycamore trees that were in the lowland was Baal Hanan, the Gederite, and over the cellars of the oil was Joash. Saul's son was named Eshbaal, or Ishbaal, man of the Lord, or man of Baal, First Chronicles chapter 8, verses 33. And Ner begot Kish, and Kish begot Shaul, or Saul, and Saul begot Jonathan, and Malchishua, and Abinadav, and Ish Baal. Jonathan's sons bore the name of Meriv Baal, the Lord contends or fights, or Baal contends or fights, First Chronicles chapter 8, verse 34. And the son of Jonathan was Meriv Baal, and Meriv Baal begat Micha, or Micah. The reason I mention these names as important is because I'm illustrating that the name Baal in these names is not referring to neutral word like Lord or reference to Yahweh. I think there was an element of the old school Baal cultic influences here. The reason I say this is because in the book of 2 Samuel, those same names have the Baal removed from them and replaced by the word Boshet, which means shame. Why the word shame? I gather because, as I suggested, these names were Baal-centric originally, and were not just a neutral word meaning Lord. They were ashamed of it, and thus removed the Baal. Here, let's take a look. 2 Samuel chapter 2, verse 8. Now Avner, the son of Ner, captains of Saul's host, had taken Esh, or Ish, Boshet, the son of Saul, and brought him over to Mahanaim. Wait, I thought that Saul's son was named as Eshbal, but here he is Eshboshet, which means man of shame. Now let's look at another example in 2 Samuel chapter 4, verse 4. Now Jonathan, Saul's son, had a son that was lame of his feet. He was five years old when the tidings came of Saul and Jonathan out of Jezreel. 
And his nurse took him up and fled. And it came to pass, as she made haste to flee, that he fell and became lame, and his name was Mepi Boshet. In the previous verse, Jonathan's son was Meriv Baal. Now his name is Mepi Boshet. <laughs> that means out of my mouth is shame. I find this change rather suspicious, don't you think? I mean, if Baal was used as simply a, to mean Lord in the previous examples, then why go out of your way to erase that? As I stated, I think Baal in those names indicated Baal the Canaanite god. The fact they removed the Baal suffix and replaced it with the word for shame is also an indication that the Baal suffix was not just a suffix after all, but a cultic reference they wanted to disavow and erase. It makes sense. They could have used other well-known suffixes, for example, el, as an Eish El would be man of God, or Mepi El would be from my mouth is God. But instead, they use the word shame. It is subtle enough to miss, but I can assure you the word choice is very direct and intentional. You're not going to find this in many occult books. Well, I guess because that's not what they cover. They don't really cover the history. They're just giving you these rituals, not really asking why about anything. But... In this situation, I'm showing you something here that if you just read the Bible from cover to cover, unless you did this in one day and you had a perfect memory, you would remember that, wait a minute, these names just changed, but that's the whole thing. No one remembers this. You have to look back and remember, wait a minute, these names used to be something else, but then suddenly the Baal is removed from the suffix, or the, or rather the suffix Baal is removed, and that means something. But no one wants to deal with it, so whatever. Let's move on. During the reigns of King David and Solomon, it appears Baal worship was on the decline. But once the kingdom divided with the death of King Solomon, Baal worship emerged with a vengeance. It is during this time we find some of the more popular names for Baal, such as Beelzebub or Baalzvuv, for example. Let us take a quick look. First, we will discuss how Baal worship took off in the kingdom of Israel, and then we will discuss how it entered the kingdom of Judah. Remember, after Solomon, the Israelites were no longer united. They split into the kingdom of Israel and the kingdom of Judah. Enter King Ahab, or in Hebrew is Ahav, and his notorious wife Jezebel whose name is rather interesting. Some scholars suggest that her name was simply a shortened version of the name Baala Zevul, which means Baal Exalted. Although this theory has not been proven, it would certainly make sense since she was the most vocal advocate for the Baal cult. And it helps the theory that her father's name was Et Baal, which means with Baal or to Baal. But I digress. In 1 Kings chapter 16, verses 30 through 31, we find the formal institutionalization of Baal worship by King Ahab and Jezebel. And Ahab, the son of Omri, did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord, above all that were before him. And it came to pass as if he had been a light thing for him to walk in the sins of Yerubam and son of Nebat, that he took to the wife Jezebel, the daughter of Etbal, king of the Sidonians, and went and served Baal and worshipped him. Those verses speak for themselves. This development was clearly not a good thing for those who believed in Yahweh. During this time, those who did not worship Baal were persecuted and killed. It was at this point things got desperate. As we progress into the book of 1 Kings, we find Elijah and the epic showdown with the priests of Baal. If you recall, I asked you to remember that Baal is a fertility and storm god. This fact will add a level of context to the verses we will cover now. Back to Elijah and the priests. God and Elijah have had it with the persecution of the Israelites for not worshipping Baal. Elijah wanted to prove that the priests of Baal, that his God, Yahweh, was mightier than Baal. Let us take a look at the verses. First, we have Elijah telling King Ahab, or Ahav, that God has decreed that there would be a drought upon the land. 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 1. 
And Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the settlers of Gilad, said unto Ahab, As the Lord, the God of Israel, liveth, before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. This is important. For all the things Yahweh could have brought onto this land, a plague, storms, and such, he decided to bring drought. This was a strategic move. This was a strategic curse. Baal, as I said, is the god of fertility, and of course the rains bring fertility upon the land. What better way to humiliate the worshippers of Baal than to bring a drought at the very time Baal is expected to provide rain? In the Baal cycle, drought is a sign of the death of Baal. Nicely played, Yahweh. Nicely played. <laughs> the story quickly escalates, and Elijah finds himself cornered on Mount Carmel by 450 priests of Baal. Let us read the story in English to save time. I will get back to showing the Hebrew in a moment. 1 Kings chapter 18, verses 20-40 through 40. So Ahab sent word throughout Israel and assembled the prophets on Mount Carmel. Elijah went before the people and said, How long will you waver between the two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, follow him. But the people said nothing. Then Elijah said to them, I am the only one of the Lord's prophets left, but Baal has 450 prophets. Get two bulls for us. Let Baal's prophets choose one for themselves and let them cut it into pieces and put it into the wood but not set fire to it. I will prepare the other bull and put it on wood but not set fire to it. Then you call on the name of your God and I will call on the name of the Lord, the God who answers by fire. He is God. Then all the people said, What you say is good. Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, Choose one of the bulls and prepare it first. Since there are so many of you, call on the name of your God, but do not light the fire. So they took the bull given them and prepared it. Then they called on the name of Baal from the morning till noon. Baal, answer us. They shouted. But there was no response. No one answered, and they danced around the altar they had made. At noon, Elijah began to taunt them. Shout louder, he said. Surely he is God. Perhaps he is deep in thought or busy or traveling. Maybe he is sleeping and must be awakened. So they shouted louder and slashed themselves with swords and spears, as was their custom, until their blood flowed. Midday passed and they continued their frantic prophesying until the time for the evening sacrifice. But there was no response. No one answered. No one paid attention. Then Elijah said all to all the people, Come here to me. They came to him, and he repaired the altar of the Lord, which had been torn down. Elijah took twelve stones, one for each of the tribes descended from Jacob, to whom the word of the Lord came, saying, Your name shall be Israel. With the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord, and he dug a trench around it large enough to hold the seed. He arranged the wood, cut the bull into pieces, and laid it on the wood. Then he said to them, Fill four large jars with water, and pour it on the offering and on the wood. Do it again, he said, and they did it again. Do it a third time, he ordered, and they did it a third time. The water ran down around the altar and even filled the trench. At the time of the sacrifice, the prophet Elijah stepped forward and prayed, Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known today that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant and have done all these things at your command. Answer me, Lord, answer me, so these people will know that you, Lord, are God, and that you are turning their hearts back again. Then the fire of the Lord fell and burned up the sacrifice. The wood, the stones, and the soil all licked up the water and the trench. When all the people saw this, they fell prostrate and cried, 
The Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. Then Elijah commanded them, Seize the prophets of Baal. Don't let anyone get away. They seized them, and Elijah had them brought down to Kishon Valley and slaughtered there. Well, suffice it to say, that was not a good day for the followers of Baal. This event was truly a devastating blow to the Baal movement. But of course, it did not end Baal worship. There are a few more instances, but I think you get the picture. Baal was an irresistible force for the Israelites, and they constantly backslide into Baal worship. Baal worship amongst the Israelites stopped once the Babylonian exile occurred. In the next chapter, we will discuss Baal worship outside of the Old Testament, more specifically in Ugarit and Egypt. There you have it, my friends, two chapters from the book Baal, the Lord of the Heavens, Calling Down the Great God of Canaan, Canaanite Magic, Book 2. I know that was a little slow going. I mean, that was probably the longest chapter in the book. But uh, let me just tell you this. That was very highly academic, I know. But the rest of the book has stuff in there that you may not have seen anywhere else. And especially towards the middle of the book where I... Uh, mention Baal within the demonological texts and the black magic texts, that's a chapter you really don't want to miss. And that is one of the most controversial chapters in the book. And like I said, that's it's going to bring a lot of people to me, you know, I don't know what they're going to do, but they're not going to necessarily like it. But some might, because then because they're the ones who may have a different view on this issue. But I hope you enjoyed it. Like I said, it, it, it was a longer chapter, but it you you probably learned quite a bit. Uh, and there's a lot of things in there that a lot of people don't know. So I hope you truly enjoyed it. And uh, if you do want to uh, purchase this book, it is in pre-release right now on Amazon.com in Kindle format. It'll be available uh, for full download in the next few days, as will the paperback and the audio within the next week and a half or so. Uh, and that's it. I hope you enjoyed it again, and uh, I will speak to you soon. So mote it be.